Warm greetings and blessings to you in the name of Jesus. I'm Nick Connolly, the pastor of the Matawan United Methodist Church in Aberdeen, New Jersey, and very pleased to offer this sermon repeated because what happened last Sunday, after what I felt was an anointed and exciting and invigorating sermon, I failed to push the record button on the webcam. So, this is a redoing of that sermon, which I pray will have similar, if not greater, anointing upon me by the Lord and upon you as you listen and as you experience, hopefully, some kind of transformation in your spirit as you go out to your life, to your loved ones, to every person that you meet that you might be filled with joy. Lord, I just thank you for this opportunity once again <clears throat> to be a spokesperson of your word. And I pray that the spontaneity and joy of offering this sermon will bless everyone who listens and lives it. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I'm pleased to share with you now the gospel that was proclaimed this past Sunday, not only in our church, but in hundreds of thousands of churches all around the globe that are following the lectionary. It's an organized way of reading the scriptures, particularly attentive on Sunday, the Sunday gospel. It's taken from the Mark chapter 4, verse 35 to 41. On that day, when evening had come, Jesus said to them, let us go across to the other side. <clears throat> and leaving the crowd behind, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. Other boats were with him. A great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat so that the boat was already being swamped. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him up and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And waking up, he rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Be silent, be still. Then the wind ceased, and there was a dead calm. He said to them, Why are you afraid? Have you still no faith and they were filled with great fear and said to one another who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him the gospel of the lord for the past several decades we've given names to the hurricanes that come in the atlantic You'll remember many of these. Harvey, Irma, Sandy, Ida, Katrina, Maria. They stand as strong episodes of weather. They have a beginning. They're predicted when they're going to be arriving. They leave out into the North Atlantic and often leave great, great destruction, damage, and deaths. So I have a question for you. What is the name of your hurricane? Here's a sample list that you might identify with. Hurricane Cancer. Hurricane Spouse's death. Hurricane unemployment. Hurricane divorce. Hurricane financial crisis. Hurricane child illness or death. Hurricane fear. Hurricane anger. Hurricane unrelenting grief. 
When these hurricanes happen in our life, they frighten us. They do many things emotionally. But the message in that gospel says, where is your faith? That God can bring you through whatever you're experiencing that seems to be devastating you. Can bring you to a new awareness of faith, of exuberance, of enthusiasm, of joy, and love. Just as the disciples were astounded that this master they were beginning to get to know now was expressing authority over the waters and the wind. Does not this God express in the gospel for today do the same for you in all that you might be experiencing? The first reading from the book of Job is a man who had hurricanes of loss and devastation, physical, family. And as he was trying to understand these things, there were conversations with three of his friends, so-called friends. Since they were of the opinion that when bad things happen, you mean you did bad things. Bad things don't happen to good people. So you must be a bad person. And relentlessly, Job kept saying, no, no, there's no reason for this. But the amplification of his pain was increased by the lack of compassion, of silence, of understanding that these friends of his failed to give him. There are three series of dialogues in the many chapters in this marvelous book, although it's, you might find it a difficult book to read, except for the fact that there's great poetry that <clears throat> attempts to give expression to all of the suffering and the interactions that Job was having with his friends. Until we get to chapter 38, when the scene shifts and we hear God speaking. Gird up your loins like a man. I will question you. And you shall declare to me. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? Verse after verse after verse are these questions, which is, accumulates probably the most sarcastic verses of the Bible about God. But it does something to Job. The questions reposition him into the mystery of his own life. And he is astounded and humbled and silenced because there are some questions that just can't be answered. There are questions we live with and wonder about and find awe in it. And gradually there comes a sense of stillness in the soul that is the result of God's grace working within us. In the ninth chapter, in the ninth Psalm, verse nine, the Lord is a stronghold for the oppressed and a stronghold in times of trouble. Stronghold, strong word, refuge, protection, all of the images that recur so frequently in the Psalms and elsewhere in the Bible where God's strength is greater than what's coming against a person. And that's what we live with in this great hope that all that's going on in the world, which is so devastating, 
the hurricanes of war, Ukraine, Gaza, Israel, Hezbollah, Hamas, all of these expressions, all of these names, they're hurricanes because the human person, when they grab a hold of power, want to seize it and hold it on to it instead of letting it go. Anything similar to that happening in your life? Do you find that you need to control to make it happen, whatever it might be that's causing you suffering? Sometimes we can't just make it happen. Sometimes we just have to let go of it, literally, emotionally, spiritually, humanly, we let go of it, but we place that letting go knowing that the Lord is picking up the essence of the suffering and the struggle. So it's so important to let God be God, to let God live inside you. God's the one that created you in your mother's womb. I've often said this, how come I was the third son of Wilhelmina and Jack Connolly, two wonderful brothers who've passed. Why wasn't it somebody else? How come I was the one? Let a similar question arise from within you. How come you were born? You can't answer that question. The how come evades any answer. There's nothing but the decision of God that in effect said, world is going to be a better place when this person emerges on the scene. I had belonged to a Jesuit religious order in the Catholic Church when I was 17, 64 years ago. And one of my spiritual fathers was a guy by the name of Freddie O'Connor, a gentle, wonderful man. We lived together in a community of seven of us on the Upper West Side of Manhattan while I was attending Union Theological Seminary. He was a dear friend. I went about, I left the Jesuits and married my wonderful wife, Gina. And then Freddie and I got together. He wanted to see me and I wanted to see him a few years after I had left the Jesuits. And he said to me, well, I was thinking of an image when you were come to visit me. I had an image that we're in a canoe together and we're coming to a divergence, two streams working off the stream that we were in. And he said to me, I knew that you were about to make a decision. I just want to let you know that whatever decision you make or you had made, I would stay in the canoe with you. That's God's promise. He's in the boat of your life with you. He will always be there. So turn your attention upon him who may at times appear like he's sleeping, uninvolved, but he's there on that sacred cushion at the base of your soul. He's there. Turn to him. Become silent with him. And be still and know that he is God. God bless you.